we're going to review for your conceptual unit nine test. All right, so it says use the graph to determine the open intervals on which the function is increasing, if any, decreasing, if any, and constant, if any. So the first thing they want to know is where is the function increasing? Well, if you trace the function from left to right, this is the leftest point, right there it's increasing, and right here it's increasing. So if I look at that, the x-coordinates that go with that, from negative infinity to 2, it's increasing. And then again at 3, because right here, it's going to start to increase. But just 3 to 4, right there it increases, and then it starts decreasing again. So the unit on which it's increasing is in red. We do our decreasing. Let's use blue. Okay, so from here to here, it's decreasing, and from here to here, it's decreasing. On the x-axis, that's from 2 to 3, and then from 4 to infinity. And then we have no constant. Constant intervals would be where it's flat or horizontal, so this one doesn't have any constant intervals. All right, same directions. So if, no, same, not same directions. Um, the graph and the equation of the function f are given. Use the graph to find any values at which f has a relative maximum and use the equation to calculate the relative maximum for each value. All right, so if I look for a maximum, it's right there, and that corresponds to x equals negative 3. That value, in other words, this y-coordinate, is what they're looking for. So to find that, you plug in negative 3 to the function. So if I find f of negative 3, I have 2 times negative 3 cubed plus 6 times negative 3 squared minus 18 times negative 3 plus 2. If I type that in left to right, just like I wrote it, 2 parentheses negative 3 caret 3 plus 6 parentheses negative 3 squared minus 18 parentheses negative 3 plus 2. And you get f of negative 3 equals 56. So that ordered pair is negative 3 comma 56. The maximum value is when x equals negative 3, and the maximum value is 56. Okay, we're going to do the same thing for the minimum. You find that lowest point, which is right there, and that's when x equals 1. Okay, so the function has a minima at 1, and what that is, I have to plug in 1 to the function. So I have 2 times 1 cubed plus 6 times 1 squared minus 18 times 1 plus 2. That's going to be 2 plus 6 minus 18 plus 2. 8, 10 minus 18 is negative 8. That ordered pair right there is 1, negative 8, so the minimum is at 1, and its value is negative 8. Okay, use the graph of f to determine each of the following. The domain of f, the range of f, the zeros of f, f of 0, the intervals on which f is increasing, decreasing, the values for which the function is less than or equal to 0, any relative maxima or minima, the values for which of x for which f of x equals 2 is f of 4 positive or negative. So man, a lot of questions here. Oh, and I didn't put the, all the answers on there, did I? I only went to g. Oops. Oh well. Alright, so the domain, you can see that it stops right there at 5, but so the domain is going to be from negative infinity to 5.5 Oh, I see, because 5 would be right there in the middle and the dot is between. So it's negative infinity to 5.5. And because that uh, circle is filled in, you use that square bracket there. The range, this thing doesn't go any higher than 2. So my, uh, my range goes from negative infinity up to 2. The zeros of f are 0 0.5 and 5.5. If you look where it crosses, it's crossing between 0 and 1. That's halfway. And if you enlarge this, it's easier to see. And it's also crossing at 5.5. So those are the two zeros. 
If I find f of 0, that means go to 0 and read the graph, would be down here at negative 1. That ordered pair would be 0, negative 1. The interval in which it's increasing, all right, let me get my little different color here. It's increasing, increasing, increasing till right there, which is, looks like at about 3. So the x-coordinates that go with that section would be negative infinity to 3. And the interval on which f is decreasing, well, get a different color, it's decreasing from 3 to here, and then it stops. So it's not 3 to infinity, it's just from 3 to 5.5, it's coming down, and then it stops. Okay, and it says, which interval or union of intervals represent the values for which f of x is less than 0? What that wants to know is, here's your y equals 0 line. They want to know the interval where the function is below that line, which is from here, right, or, oh, I'm sorry, or equal to 0. So we've also got to do that, that point right there. So we have from negative infinity to right there, which is, 0 0.5 union and then we have another 0 it's not less than 0 but it's equal to 0 right at 5.5 that's where that's coming from all right for h i and j that aren't on here sorry h says any relative maxima or minima we do not have a, ma a minimum but we do have a maximum which is right there and that ordered pair would be at 3 comma 2. So you have a maximum at 3, and its value is 2. Okay, my minimum, there is no minimum. Minimum, there is none. Okay, for i, they want to know the values of x for which f of x equals 2. So they want to know what points have a y-coordinate of 2. Well, only one does, and again, it's this point. So when it says the values for which f of x equals 2, well, at f of 3, you get 2. Okay, so the values would be 3. And then j is f of 4, positive or negative. Well, if I go to 4 and then read the graph, it's at, I don't know, 1 point something, so it's positive. Okay. All right, it says evaluate the piecewise function at the given values of the independent variable. So this says that they want you to use g of x equals x plus 4. In other words, they want you to add 4 to your x if they give you an x that's greater than or equal to negative 4. If, 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 if x is less than negative 4, then they want you to use this function. Okay, so for a, they want me to find g of 0. 0 is less than negative 4, so I have to use the bottom function. I'm going to use negative x plus 4 replace my x with 0, that's going to be a negative 4. Why did they get positive 4? Oh, I'm an idiot. 0 is greater than negative 4. My bad. So i got to use the top one, which is just x plus 4. So if I plug in 0, I get 4. Okay, g of negative 6. Negative 6 is less than negative 4. Yes, I got that right this time. So I'm going to use the bottom function, which says negative x plus 4. So I plug in my negative 6, and I get negative 6 plus 4, which is a negative negative 2, which is a positive 2. And then to find g of 1... 1 is greater than or equal to negative 4, so I'm using the x plus 4 1, so I plug in 1, and I get 5, and that order pair would be 1, 5, this would be negative 6, 2, and this would be 0, 4. Okay? Alright, evaluate this piecewise function at the given values of the independent variables. This one says if x isn't 5, you plug it into the top one. If x is 5, you get 7, no matter what. So to find h of 3, 3 is not 5, so I'm using x squared minus 25 over x minus 5, and I plug it in, 3 squared minus 25 over 3 minus 5, that'd be 9 minus 25 over a negative 2, 
9 minus 25 is negative 16 divided by negative 2 is positive 8. So h of 3 is 8. That would pass through 3, 8. Okay, to find h of 0, figure out which one it may, matches. 0 does not equal 5, so again I'm using the top one. Plugging in 0, so I'd have 0 squared minus 25 over 0 minus 5. That's a negative 25 divided by a negative 5, which is positive 5. That ordered pair would be 0, 5. And the third one wants me to find h of 5. Well, 5 does equal 5, so they want me to use the second one. There's no x to change, so my answer is just 7. That ordered pair would be 5, 7. All right. This one says the domain of the piecewise function is negative infinity to infinity. They want you to graph the function and use your graph to determine the function's range. All right, so the first one says to graph y equals negative 5x if x is less than or equal to 0. So what I'm going to do is draw a graph here. color. Alright, so this says pick x's that are less than or equal to 0. So I'm going to pick 0 first. So if I find f of 0, I'm going to have negative 5 times 0, which would be 0. So that ordered pair would be 0, 0. Pick something else. I know this is going to be a line, so all I need is two points. Pick something else smaller than 0. So let's pick f of negative 1. That would give me negative 5 times negative 1, which would give me 5. That's going to give me negative 1, comma 5. So if I plot those ordered pairs, 0, 0, negative 1, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And it says include, so these are both going to be solid circles. And that would be my line. Okay, that goes from x is less than or equal to 0. Then it wants me to graph f of x equals negative 4 if x is greater than 0. Well, you can pick numbers all you want, but if I pick 0, I get negative 4. So that's going to be 0, negative 4. If I pick something bigger, but this one's going to be an open circle because it's not including 0. Pick something bigger, pick f of 2. I don't care what you pick, you're still going to get negative 4. So that ordered pair would be neg or 2, negative 4. And if I plot those ordered pairs, 0, negative 4, that's going to be an open circle. 2, negative 4, and connect, that's going to be a horizontal or a constant function, and there is my graph, okay, and so where would my range be, well, it starts at negative 4, it doesn't include it, but it starts at negative 4, see how they use those squiggly brackets instead of round ones, that means it's just a point, union, and then it starts again and includes zero, because that's filled in, and that part will continue going to infinity. Okay? All right, it says the domain of the piecewise function is negative infinity to infinity. They want you to graph the function and determine the range again. All right, so if I draw my graph, colors here. Alright, so the first one they want me to graph is this, which says f of x equals 0 if x is less than negative 5. So if I plug in negative 5, I get 0. So negative 5, 0, and that's going to be an open circle because it's not included. Pick something smaller, let's pick negative 10, it doesn't matter because I'm going to get 0. That ordered pair would be negative 10, 0. All right, so if I graph that, negative 5, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Oops, that's going to be an open circle. And negative 10, 0 would be this. So I'm just going to graph this line. It goes this way, yes, with an open circle there. All right, then they want me to graph negative 3x if x is between negative 5 and 0. So if I want to do, let me change colors f of x equals negative 3x if x is between negative 5 and 0. So what you do, I'm going to pick negative 5. Notice this one has a bar and this one doesn't. So if I pick negative 5, 
I'm going to get negative 3 times negative 5, crap, I'm not going to bring the graph, is going to be positive 15. Alright, so that ordered pair would be negative 5, 15, and that one's going to be included. Okay, and then let's see, um, pick something, i got to pick something smaller than pick 0, because that's the other limit. If I pick 0, I get negative 3 times 0, which is 0, so that's going to go through 0, 0, and that one's not going to be included. Alright, so I have an open circle there, and a closed circle there, and if I connect that, I get this. Yeah. Alright, so there's the middle one, and then the last one they want me to graph is f of x equals x squared if x is greater than or equal to 0. So if I plug in 0, I get 0 squared, which is 0, so that's going to go through 0, 0, and that's going to be a closed circle. Okay, and then pick something bigger than 0, let's pick 2. That would be 2 squared, which is 4, so that's going to go through 2, 4. And that is going to be a parabola, just half of it. So I'm going to just graph this parabola-looking thing. Okay, and the graph that matches that would be this one. Your range, nothing is below 0. 0 is actually included because this dot got filled in. So even though that one was open and the blue one was open, red covered it. So it's in the range, and it goes from 0 up to infinity. Okay? Alright, it says let f be defined by the graph to the right. Find the square root of f of negative 2.4 plus f of 1.2 plus all that other stuff. Okay? So negative 2.4 would be about right there. If I go up to the graph, that puts me at 4. So this is 4. F of 1.2. 1 1.2 1 would be about right here, which is right there, so its value is 0. F of pi, pi is 3.14, so that's about right here. So if I go down, its value is negative 2, so this right here is negative 2. F of negative 1, I go up. That circle's filled in at 2, so this is 2. Divided by f of 2, if I go to 2 and go to the part that's filled in, that's negative 1. And negative pi would be negative 3.14. If I go up to the graph, that gives me this graph, which is 5. So, if I do the square root of 4 plus 0, a little bit long there, Tinder, minus the negative 2 squared plus 2 divided by negative 1 times 5. This is going to be the square root of 4, which is 2. This is going to be a positive 4. I got to do division next. 2 divided by negative 1 is negative 2 times 5. I got to multiply next is negative 10. So 2 minus 4, that's negative 2, minus 10 is negative 12. Okay, alright, so this one says we have to write a piecewise function that models the cellular phone billing plan described below. Let x represent the number of minutes used and c of x represent the cost of those x minutes, then graph the function. So you get charged $30 a month, that buys you 350 minutes. After that, it's going to cost you an extra $20 a minute. So my first function is, they do the cost of x, okay, and you do this because you're going to get, you have two separate things. You're going to pay 30 bucks as long as your time stays between 0 and 350 minutes. If you go over 350 minutes, then it's going to be the $30 plus the number, plus, what are we charging? Uh, 20 cents for every minute over 350. So the number of minutes, take away the 350 that are free, 
is going to be your function. Now where did they get this? Well, they cleaned this up. So they distributed and they got 30 plus 0.20x. If you take 0.2 times 350, you get minus 70. Combine like terms and you get 0.20x minus 40, which is where they got that from. So c of x equals 0.20x minus 40. And then this one is if your minutes go over 350. So that's where they got those holes from. And then they want you to graph it. Well, this says, okay, if, I don't know what their scale there is, they're going by here, but if that's to 450, let me count by 50s, 51, 52, 53, 50, yeah, they're counting by 50s. So this says I'm going to graph C of X equals 30, which is a, a constant function. It's just a flat from 0 to 350. So from 0 to 350, and those are both filled in circles, it's going to be a flat 30 bucks. After that, then I have to graph this. So if I plot some points or pick, it, pick some numbers, but you really don't have to, you know that this is going to, from this point on, you're going to have this slope of 0.20. So it's going to go up and rise. So this one's the only one that makes sense. These don't because it doesn't go to 350. This has the thing at 350 in the line, but you wouldn't want this part or that part because those don't belong to the graph anymore. And this one would be that you're paying the 20 cents a minute and then leveling off over, and then, no, that'd be nice, but no. Okay, so your graph is D. All right, so it says, here's part of the 2011 federal tax rate schedule X that specifies the tax owed by a single taxpayer. It says, find and interpret, I'll click the icon to do the piece, and I didn't click it, sorry. So apparently they wrote it in a, in a piecewise function for us. But at any rate, we would... Uh, poop, I'm going to have to do that, aren't I? Okay, T of 17,390. That is going to be in this bracket. Okay, because 17,390 is between 8,500 and 34,500. So to figure out the tax that I owe, all right, you're going to pay the 850, I'm going to pay 850 plus 15% of the amount over 8,500. So I'm going to have to take my number, 17,390, and take away the 8,500, and that will be my answer. So if I do 17, if I just type it, 850, plus 0.15 parentheses 17,390 minus 8,500, I get 2,183.50. That's the tax that I would have to pay on making $17,000. Okay. All right. This one gives you the tax rate schedule, and you are supposed to come up with the the piecewise schedule. Alright, so this would say that if you make z between 0 and 8,000, you're going to pay 0 plus 11 percent of anything over 0, which would be x. So that's the first one. If x is between 0 and 8,000, you pay 0.11 percent, or 0.11, you pay 11 percent of what you make. The next one, okay, says that you're going to pay $880 plus 15% of anything over 8,000, which would be your money take away 8,000. That would be what's over 8,000. And that is when your money is between 8,000 and 30,700. Okay? Then this one, the next tax rate is you're going to pay 4,285 plus 0.24 of anything over 30,000. So to figure out what you have over 30,700, you have to subtract your money, which would be the X. OK? 
Okay, and that is when your money is between 30700 and 74200 And then the last one, you would pay this much tax, 14000 plus 33% of anything over 742. So the X minus would give you everything over that amount of money. And that's if you make over 74,200. Okay? All right, so this one says the figure shows the cost of mailing a first class letter. F of X is a function of its weight X in ounces. For weights not exceeding 3.5 ounces, Oh, for weights not exceeding 3.5 ounces. For anything that is bigger than 3.5 ounces but less than 4 ounces, the cost jumps to $1.35. The cost then increases by 18 cents per ounce for weights not exceeding 13 ounces. So it says use this information to extend the graph shown so that the function's domain is 0 to 13. All right, so... <coughs> well, I should have expanded this a lot bigger, shouldn't I have? All right, so what's going to happen is from 0 to 1 ounce, it's saying that, let's look at this here, weights in ounces, weights not exceeding 3.5 ounces, Cost Not really following their graph here. And ounces for weights not exceeding 3.5 ounces. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, they've drawn the graph. So anything between 0 and 1 ounces costs you 42 cents. For anything between 1 and 2 ounces costs you 59. 2 to 3 ounces costs you 76. 3 to 4, which they're not extending here. Oh no, 3, yeah, 3 and a half. For, three, for X is bigger than 3 and a half and less than equal to 4. Oh, I see. Three ounces to three and a half ounces is 93 cents. I get it. Okay, so if I extend this out, they've already done that much of it. If I do starting at three, four, five, six, then we go to 13, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Okay, and we've got, what are we doing here? So between 3.5 and 4, the cost jumps to $1.35. So from 3, not including 3.5, so that one's open, to 4, that one's closed, it's $1.35. After that, then we start increasing by 18 cents per ounce. So between 4 and 5 I live in from point 5 though. 18 cents per ounce oh, this is not very this is very confusing here so from I'm assuming four ounces then to five ounces. That's a dollar thirty-five. One thirty-five plus eighteen cents. There you go. There's your dollar fifty-three. So from four to five ounces, it's going to jump up to a dollar fifty-three. So starting at four, not including four, because if it is four, it's the bottom. But to five, up and including five, is going to be a dollar fifty-three. And then from 5 to 6, if I add 18 cents, there we go, you get the $1.71. So from 5 to 
six, I'm going to go up to a dollar seventy one. Five is going to be open. Six is going to be closed, and it jumps up to a dollar seventy one. All right, and then let's see. For seven ounces, up to seven ounces, it's going to jump up another eighteen cents. So that's going to be a dollar eighty nine. So from six to seven. That's going to jump up to $1.89. And then up to 8 ounces, add another 18 cents, is going to be 207. So from 7 open to 8, it's going to jump up to $2.07. For 9 ounces, you add another 18 cents, and you get $2.25. Okay, so from 8 to 9, that one's closed, that one's open, sorry. From 8 to 9, you're going to jump up to $2.25. Okay, for 10 ounces, add another 18 cents, you're going to get $2.43. So I jump up to $2.43 going from 9 to 10. 10 to 9, all of it, 9 to 10, 10 to 11, I don't know what I'm 9 to 10, yeah, 9 to 10, open, close, and then up to 11 ounces, add 18 cents, it's going to be 261, so 261 is going to be from 10 to 11, open, close, up to 12, Add another 18 cents, and you get $2.79. So you're going to have from 9 to 11 to 12, you're going to have open, close, and then up to 13 ounces is going to be another 18 cents. That's going to be $2.97, which will go from here to here. And so now when you enlarge these graphs, okay, we know these are not it because they're step functions, okay, so when you enlarge these graphs, I'm not really sure what the difference between those two is, but I'm sure you can tell if you enlarge them, and B would be the graph that matches. All right, that one was not worded very well. All right, so... It says, find the average rate of change of the function f of x equals x squared plus 9x from x sub 1 equal 1 to x sub 2 equals 2. So what they're telling me is to find f of 1 and to find f of 2, and then that will give me two ordered pairs that I can make an average rate of change, which remember is a fancy word for slope, which is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So if I plug in 1 to my function, I have 1 squared plus 9 times 1. That's going to be 1 plus 9 is 10. So that ordered pair would be 1, 10. Find f of 2, plug in 2. 2 squared plus 9 times 2. That's going to be 4 plus 18, which is going to be 22, which gives me 2, comma, 22. So to find my slope, I take y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, and I get 12 over 1, which is 12. The average rate of change is 12. Okay. The graph on the right shows the remaining life expectancy E in years for females of age X. Find the average rate of change between the ages 50 and 60. So we've got 50 and 60. So those two ordered pairs are 50 comma 29.3 and 60 comma 19.8. So to find that slope, you're going to take y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Okay. So if I do 19.8 minus 29.3, I get negative 9.5 over 10. And if you divide that out, you get the slope is negative 0.95. Okay, then it says if the average rate of change between ages 80 and 90 is negative 0.48, this means that 
Well, if, if your average is, ne is negative 0.48, that means that your life expectancy is decreasing by 0.48 years between the ages of 80 and 90. You get no. All right, so let's find the domain of the function. Domain, you're looking for denominators may never equal zero, and even radicals must stay positive. There's no drama here. There's no denominator with x's in it. There's no radicals with x's in it. So there's no restrictions. Your domain goes forever and ever, ever, all real numbers. You can see there's no gaps or jumps in here. So the domain is everything. All right, find the domain of this function. Again, I'm looking at the graph. You can tell that there's going to be jumps and there's going to be restrictions on my domain because you have breaks in your graph. And again, for this one, you say, Mr. Denominator, you may never equal zero. So I say x squared minus 10x minus 56, you may never equal zero. If I factor that, x and x, factors of 56 that make 10 are going to be 4 and 14. I think it's 4 times 14, 56, yeah. And 14 and 4 will make 10. C is negative, so only bully gets the middle. This says that x plus 4 can't equal 0. And this says x minus 14 can't equal 0. So x can never equal negative 4, and x can never equal 14. If you plot that, negative 4 is going to have a hole. 14 is going to have a hole right here. And right here, you can see. But everywhere else, they can graph. So my domain goes from negative infinity to negative 4, union, negative 4 to 14, union, 14 to infinity. Okay? All right, find the domain of this function. Again, you can see your gaps here and your gaps here. But still, you have to say all Mr. Denominators can never equal 0. So I have to say x squared plus 1 can never equal 0 and x squared minus 9 can never equal 0. If I solve these, minus 1, minus 1, x squared can never equal negative 1, square root, square root, x can never equal plus or minus i, which causes no drama. This says the only drama that could be caused is something by not real. So this doesn't pose any restrictions to us. Let's solve this one, add 9 to both sides. I get x squared can never equal 9, square root, x can never equal plus or minus 3. And notice, there's your negative 3 gap, there's your positive 3 gap, which means at negative 3 and positive 3, I have to jump, but everywhere else I can color, which says negative infinity to negative 3, union, negative 3 to 3, union, 3 to infinity. Yeah, yeah. All right, find the domain of this function. We've got a double whammy here because not only do we have a denominator with a letter in it, we have a radical with a letter in it, and you've got to do them both. So if I say, Mr. Denominator, you may never equal zero, I also have to say, Mr. Radical, you must always stay greater than or equal to zero. So numerically, you're going to get the same answer solving this. Square, square, x minus 8 can never equal zero, x can never equal 8. If you solve this one, it says square, square, x minus 8 has to stay greater than 0, so x has to stay greater than or equal to 8. So what that says is, this says that x can't be 8. This says that x can be 8 and go forever and ever this way. So what my domain is, is where they overlap, and a no always outweighs a yes. So this is going to be round, and then these would have, okay, for my, sorry, I should have done this. For the first one, I could color everywhere else. For the second one, just in blue. So where there's blue and red is here, which goes from 8, doesn't include it, though, because the no outweighs the yes, and it goes to infinity. And you can see the graph. This thing does this. It doesn't even start until 8, and then it, sorry, it goes on. All right, so let's find the domain of this one. We have two restrictions. We have Mr. Denominator can never equal zero, and Mr. Radical must always stay positive. So this says x can never equal 6. This, if I square, square, I get x minus 4 has to stay greater than 0, so x has to stay greater than or equal to 4. 
So if I get the there's four, there's six. All right. So this says that x can't be six, but it could be everywhere else. Okay. So blue is the x can't be six. If I graph this, this says that I can include the four, but I have to go greater than. So now I want where they overlap, and that would be here, I, and I can include four because I didn't jump over four in the other one. I can include the four, okay? So this is included, green and blue, green and blue, green and blue. I have to jump there because a no outweighs a yes. Green and blue, green and blue, green and blue. So that goes, starts at and includes four, goes to six, union, six to infinity. Okay. All right, it says first find f plus g, f minus g, f times g, and f divided by g, then determine the domain of each function. All right, well, to do your f plus g, f minus g, and f times g, your domain is going to be all real numbers because neither function has any drama in it. So when you add, subtract, multiply, you're not going to have any drama. Division, that's going to cause drama because division is going to give us a denominator that has an x in it. All right, so to find f plus g, you take 4x squared minus 31x plus 21, and you add it to x minus 7. So really what you're going to do, this is f plus g, you're going to combine like terms. So that's going to be 4x squared. Negative 31x plus x is going to be minus 30x. And a positive 21 take away 7 is going to be a positive 14. So there's your sum. Domain is all real numbers. f minus g, you're going to take the f functions. 4x squared minus 31x plus 21. And you're going to subtract g, x minus 7. Subtraction you got to be careful of. What the heck? I even have skipped about 10 slides there. Subtraction you have to be careful of. You're going to have to distribute that minus. So it's going to be 4x squared minus 31x plus 21 minus x plus 7. So that would give me 4x squared minus 32x plus 28. And there's your subtraction. Again, domain is all real numbers. F times G. Apparently I didn't copy all the F. Oh, it's right down here. F times G. Oh, there's answers all over the place here. Okay, f times g, you're going to take 4x squared minus 31x plus 21, and you're going to multiply it by x minus 7. So if I distribute, I get 4x cubed minus 28x squared minus 31x squared plus 31 times 7 is 217x plus... 21x minus 21 times 7 is 147. Combine like terms, I'm going to get 4x cubed. Combine your squares, negative 28, negative 31 is negative 59x squared. Combine your x's, you get positive 238x minus 147 on the end. There's your times. The domain, again, is going to be all real numbers. And now we have to do the division, which is going to be 4x squared minus 31x plus 21 over x minus 7. Well, how the heck did they end up with 4x minus 3? They factored the top and canceled. But before we do that, this says, for domain purposes, this says x may never equal 7. So on a number line, I have to skip 7, but I can go everywhere else. So my domain is negative infinity to 7, union 7 to infinity. So now let's simplify it. If I can't factor anything out, I'm going to do 4 times 21 
That's going to give me 84. Factors of 84 that make 31. 7 has got to be 1. No. 7 and 12 don't make 31. Oh. No. Hmm. 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 4 times 21 is 84. Factors of 84. 1 and 84 are not going to make 31. 2 and 42 are not going to make 31. 3 and 28. 8, 20, 29, 30, 31, that's going to work. 3 and 28. So if I rewrite, oh, I wish I had my room. If I rewrite, I'm going to have 4x squared. Uh, minus 28x plus 3x. Oh no, they both have to be minus. Minus 28x minus 3x plus 21. 2 by 2. I can factor out a 4x would leave x minus 7. I can factor out a negative 3 leaves x minus 7. I can factor out an x minus 7 that leaves 4x minus 3. So the top of this factors into 4x minus 3 times x minus 7 over x minus 7, and those cancel. So what I end up with is 4x minus 3, and that's my domain. Even though it canceled, it's still going to cause a break in my graph. All right. So here we go again. They want me to find f plus g, f minus g, f times g, f divided by g, and determine the domain of each. All right, well, your domain of f is going to say, Mr. Radical, you must always stay positive, which says x has to be greater than or equal to 0. The domain of g is all real numbers. So you have this one that says you have to stay greater than or equal to 0. And you have the other one that says that the domain is all real numbers, so where they overlap is in here. So your domain would be from zero, including it, to infinity. Okay, and that will work for your sum, your difference, and your multiplication. It's going to change on division because we're going to create a, another denominator. All right, so to find f plus g, you take the f function plus the g function. I can't combine any like terms, so that's it. To do subtraction, you would do the f function minus the g function. You're going to have to distribute that negative, which gives you the square root of x minus x plus 14. Okay, times, you're going to take the square root of x times x minus 14. If I distribute, I get x times the square root of x minus 14 times the square root of x. There's your multiplication, same domain. To do your division, you're going to take your f function, and you're going to put it over your g function, and I can't simplify. So that's my division, but now we have a denominator on top of this. We still have... We still have this restriction, but now we're going to add another restriction to it, and we're going to say, Mr. Denominator, you may never equal 0, so x may never equal 14. So at 14, we're going to have a jump, which means I can go everywhere except for there, which gives me a domain that goes, include 0 to 14, jump it, and it goes 14 to infinity. Okay. All right, it says functions f and g are given as follows. It says find each of the following functions and state its domain. All right, f plus g of x. So we're going to have 2x over x minus 4 plus 9 over x plus 8. To add those, we have to get a common denominator, which is going to be one of each of those. So this one's missing an x plus 8. I got to put it on top and on bottom. And this one's missing an x minus 4. I'm going to put on top and on bottom. And now do the denominators have the same factors in it? Yes, they do. So I'm going to keep that denominator, x plus 8 times x minus 4. And I'm going to do the numerators, which says 2x squared 
plus 16x. <clears throat> this one says plus 9x minus 36. So now if I combine like terms on top, I get 2x squared plus 25x minus 36 over x minus 4 times x minus 8. Your domain, sorry, I should have done that first. My domain of F says that X can never equal 4. My domain of G says that X may never equal negative 8. So for domain, I have to skip negative 8 and 4, but I can color everywhere else, which gives me a domain of negative infinity to negative 8, union negative 8 to 4, union 4 to infinity. And that will work on our sum, our difference, and our multiplication. So you don't have to worry about those on the rest of them. All right, to get subtraction, now I'm not going to redo this every stinking time. I already got a common denominator. The only thing that's going to be different is this is going to turn into a minus. So to do the subtraction, I'm going to have the 2x squared. Well, I better not skip that. You're going to go, what the heck did you do? So I have my 2x over x minus 4 minus 9 over x plus 8. So again, if I get my common denominator, I need one of each. But I got to do it to the top. And now I'm going to have a common denominator. And on top, I'm going to have my 2x squared plus 16x. And over here, I'm going to have my 9x minus 36, but I have to subtract those. So that's going to be minus 9x plus 36, which if I combine like terms, I get 2x squared plus 7x plus 36 over the common denominator. Same uh, domain. All right, f times g. We're going to take the f function and we're going to multiply it by the g function. And when you multiply fractions, you multiply straight across the top, which is going to give me 18x. And you multiply straight across the bottom, and they didn't multiply it out. They just left it in factors. And there's my product, same denominator. Okay. Now for f divided by g, I'm going to take 2x over x minus 4. And I'm going to divide it by g, which is 9 over x plus 8. To simplify that, I'm going to keep, change, flip. And that gives me 2x times x plus 8 over 9 times x minus 4. Distribute on top and I get 2x squared plus 16x, and I don't know why they didn't distribute on the bottom, over 9 times x minus 4. There's my division, and now to check my um, domain, I still have the can't be negative 8 or 4, but I gotta see if there's anything in addition to that. My new denominator is 9 times x minus 4, which can never equal 0. That says 9x minus 36 can never equal 0. So 9x can never equal 36. Divide by 9, x can never equal 4. Well, I already had that restriction. So my domain is not going to change. I don't have any new restrictions on top of the ones I already had. Okay? All right, it says for f of x equals x squared plus 3 and g of x equals x squared minus 5, five find the following functions. Okay, for A, they want me to find F of G of X. That says, inside parentheses first, says take the G function, which is this. So I'm going to replace this with the G function, which is X squared minus 5. That says copy the F function and add 3. So what am I bringing to the F function? I'm bringing X squared minus 5. To square that without killing puppies, we make two copies. And distribute, that's going to give me x to the fourth minus 5x squared minus 5x squared plus 25 plus 3. 
That gives me x to the fourth minus 10x squared plus 28. So f of g of x equals x to the fourth minus 10x squared plus 28. To find g of f of x, g of f of x, inside parentheses first, that says replace the inside with the f function. So I'm doing g of x squared plus 3. I just replaced f of x with what it's worth. Now this says copy the g function, which is whatever you bring squared at minus 5. Plug in what you brought, x squared plus 3. Simplify. Two copies, so I don't kill puppies. That's x to the fourth plus 3x plus 3x plus 9 minus 5, combine like terms, x to the 4th plus 6x plus 4. Okay? Excuse me. Oops. Now they want us to find f of g of 3. To find f of g of 3, Again, we have to start with inside parentheses first, which says take 3 to the g function. So my g function says whatever I brought minus 5. And they're telling me to plug in 3 there. That gives me 9 minus 5. 9, nine minus 5, which gives me 4. That is what I need now need to take to the f function. So I simplified g of 3 and got 4, and I'm taking my answer to the f party which says whatever you brought plus 3. So if I plug in 4, I get 16 plus 3 is 19. Okay, then they want me to find g of f of 3. So that says to find g of f of 3. This says take 3 to the f party and see what you get. So to find f of 3, I would say something squared plus 3, plug in 3, that's 9 plus 3, that's 12. So now I can find g of 12, because f of 3 is 12. Now plug it in there, and they want me to find g of 12, which says, copy the g function, whatever you brought, square it and subtract 5. I brought 12, squared is 144, minus 5 is 139. Okay. All right. For they want the same directions. Okay, but they're just giving us different functions. So to find f of g of x, this says inside parentheses first find f of the g function, which is x plus four. So that says, copy the f function, which says the square root of whatever you brought, and I brought x plus 4, which I can't simplify, so that's f of g of x. Alright, so now to find g of f of x, inside parentheses first, okay, go get the f function and plug it in. The f function is the square root of x, so now I'm taking that to the g function which says whatever you brought plus 4 and I brought a square root of x and you can't simplify that so square root of x plus 4 is your answer to find f of g of 5 we have to find g of 5 first which says whatever you brought plus 4 plug in 5 and you get 9 so I can replace g of 5 with 9, which means they want me now to find f of 9. And f of 9 says take the square root of whatever you brought. I'm bringing 9. The square root of 9 is 3. Okay, so now to find g of f of 5, inside parentheses first. So I'm going to have to find f of 5, which says the square root of whatever you brought. And I brought a 5, and I can't simplify that. So if I replace f of 5 with the square root of 5, and now go to the g house, which says whatever you brought plus 4, 
I'm bringing the square root of 5. I can't simplify, so it's the square root of 5 plus 1. Okay? Alright, so same directions. They want us to find f of g of x. So I have to find, go we'll get g of x. g of x equals x plus 1 over 5. I'm going to plug that in there. So they want me to find f of x plus 1 over 5. So now I'm going to plug this into the f function, which says 5 times whatever you brought minus 1. I brought x plus 1 over 5. Those cancel. That gives me x plus 1 minus 1. Those cancel, which gives me x. So f of g of x equals x. Then they want me to find g of f of x. Well, f of x equals 5x minus 1. So they're wanting me to find g of 5x minus 1 which would be copy the g function, leave out x, and plug in what you brought, which is 5x minus 1. Those cancel. That leaves me 5x over 5. Those cancel, which leaves me x. These functions are inverses because their compositions both came out to be the mother function. Okay, then we have to do the number ones. They want me to find f of g of 5. Well, that means I have to find g of 5 first, which means whatever I brought plus 1 over 5. And I brought 1. I mean, I brought 5. Sorry. So that would be 6 fifths. That's going to go, so g of 5 is 6 fifths. So I'm finding f of 6 fifths, which would be 5 times whatever you brought minus 1. And I brought... 6 fifths, the 5's cancel, I get 6 minus 1, which is 5. So f of g of 5 equals 5. And now let's find g of f of 5. It's like they're inverses, it's the same thing, but let's do it. Alright, so if I do g of f of 5, I have to find f of 5 first, which means, where's my f? 5 times whatever I brought minus 1. I brought a 5. That's 25 minus 1 is 24. So since f of 5 equals 24, they want me to find g of 24, which g says whatever you brought plus 1 over 5. I brought 24 plus 1 is 25 divided by 5 is 5. Okay? Alright, this one, they want us to find the composition and the domain of the composition. Alright, so since we're finding f of g of x, for as far as domain goes, you have to find the domain of g, whatever's on the inside. And that says, for the domain of g, x can never equal zero. So, so far, we have a jump at zero, but it can be everywhere else. There's the domain of G. Now let's find the composition, and we have to find the domain of the composition and see if that adds any other restrictions. So this one says find G of X first. G of X is 9 over X. So they want me to replace that there. So they want me to find F of 9 over X. Well, that would be 7 over whatever you brought plus 7. And I brought 9 over X. To simplify this bad boy, we're going to have to get a common denominator, which would be x. So times x times x. That becomes 7 over 9 over x plus 7x over x, which gives me 7 over 9 plus 7x over x. Yes? And then if I keep, change, flip that, Top times top, I get 7x over 9 plus 7x. So f of g of x equals 7x over 9 plus 7x. There's your composition. Now we're going to have more drama because now I have a denominator, Mr. Denominator, you may never equal 0. 
minus 9 minus 9, 7x may never equal negative 9. Um, divide by 7, divide by 7, x may never equal negative 9 7. So wherever that is, is going to be another jump. So now I have two holes. So my domain can be everywhere but there, which goes from negative infinity to negative 9 7, union negative 9 7 to 0, union 0 to infinity. Okay? Alright, they want us to find f of g of x and the domain. So if I'm finding f of g of x, as far as my domain goes, since g is on the inside, I need the domain of g of x, which says, Mr. Radical, you may always, must always stay positive. So I have square root of square square, and I get 6 minus x has to be greater than or equal to 0, minus 6. Negative x has to be greater than or equal to negative 6. Divide by negative 1. And x has to stay less than or equal to 6. So right now, my domain says I have to stay equal to or smaller than 6. Give me just a second. Alright. Sorry, I had to go to the little girl's room more information than you needed, but whatever. All right, so where are we at? We have to find, oh, we found the domain of g. So now we have to find f of g of x. So we have to get g of x first, and g of x is the square root of 6 minus x. So if I put that in here, they want me to find f of the square root of 6 minus x. f says whatever you brought, square it and add 1. So if I plug in what I brought, the square root of 6 minus x, square square root cancels, and I get 6 minus x plus 1. That gives me negative x plus 7, which they wrote 7 minus x. Okay. There's my composition, and then it says, what is the domain of f of g? Well, there's no more drama. I don't have a radical anymore, and I don't have any denominators, so there's no more extra drama which means this is my domain of the composition, which goes from negative infinity to 6. 6 is included, negative infinity is not. Alright, it says express the given function as a composition of two functions, f and g, so that h of x equals f of g of x, where one of the functions is 4x minus 1. It's very simple. Your f function is always going to be the power, and then just whatever's inside, ignore it. So it would just be f of x equals x to the 7th. Your g function is whatever you raise to the power, so g is 4x minus 1. Okay, if we do this one again, your power, and it's a radical, but that's a power. So ignore what's underneath, and the f function is the, core, or the fourth root of x. And then your g is whatever is underneath, so it's x squared minus 8. Okay. All right, it says a company that sells radios has yearly fixed costs of $500,000. It costs the company $50 to produce each radio. Each radio will sell for $70. The company's costs and revenues are modeled by the following functions, where X represents the number of radios produced and sold. So, again, your cost function, it costs you $50,000 plus $50 for every radio you make. Your revenue function, that's what you make, since you're selling them for 70, you're going to make 70 per radio you make. So they want me to find and interpret R minus C of 12,500. So what you do is you find R of 12,500, you find C of 12,500, and you subtract them. So if I plug in 12,500 to the R function, I would get 70 times 12,500. And here, if I plug in 12,500 to the C function, but now be careful, I'm subtracting. So I'm going to use brackets. That's going to be 500,000 plus 50 times 12,500. So if I do 70 times 12,500, I get... 875000 minus, if I do inside parentheses here, I've got 500,000 
plus 50 parentheses 12,500 and you get uh, 1125000. So if I subtract those, 8750000 minus 1125000, I get negative 250,000. Okay, so our minus C of 12,500 is negative $250,000. Negative, which means if you produce 12,500 radios, you're going to have a loss of $250,000. All right, if I say R minus, if I find R minus C of 25,000, we're taking R of 25,000 minus C of 25,000. So we do this whole thing again. I'm going to have 70 times 25,000 minus 500,000. One, two, one, two, three. Plus 50 times 2,500. And if you do the math, 70 times 25,000, you get 1750000. If you type this in, 500,000 plus. 50 times 2,500, you get, what did I do? 500,000, R25,000, right? 500,000 plus 50 times, oops, I did 2,500, not 25,000. Be careful, unlike the teacher. All right, let's try that again. 70 times 25,000. Okay, and then we got 500,000 plus 50 times 25,000. And you get 1750000. And if you subtract those, you get zero. So what does that mean? Well, if your revenue minus your cost comes out zero, that means you broke even. If you sell 25,000 radios, you don't make or lose money, you break even. All right, so then they want me to do R of 37.5 minus C of 37.5. That would give me 70 times 37,500 minus 500,000 plus 50 times 37,500. So if I do 70 times 37.5, I get 2625000 minus 500,000 plus 50 times 37,500. I get 2375000. If I subtract those, you get 250,000. And what that means is if the company sells 37,500 radios, it will profit, because it's positive, by 250 grand. Okay? All right, a department store has two locations in a city. From 2008 through 2012, the profits for each of the store's two branches are modeled by the functions F and G. In each model, X represents the number of years after 2008, and F and G represent the profit in millions of dollars. A, what is the slope of F, and describe what this means. Slope, guys, you're talking linear functions. These are first-degree functions, which means linear, which means MX plus B. Your slope is whatever is touching X. So the slope of, negative is the ne the slope of F is negative, 0.36, which means the profit is going down every year. Okay, so B says, what is the slope of G? Well, G of X is 0.39X plus 10.73. There's his slope, 0.39, which means his profit is increasing every year. So to find F plus G, I take negative 0.36X plus 14.04 minus 0.39x plus 10.73. Distribute your negative and I have negative 0.36x sorry we're not adding, we're not subtracting, we're adding so I don't really need parentheses. Alright so just combine like terms so I have negative 0.36 plus 0.39 
which gives me 0.03x and combine those 14.04 plus 10.73 and I get 24.77 there's my F plus G and the slope of this guy is 0.03 which means the slope is increasing every year all right, the regular price of a computer is x dollars. Let f of x be x minus 260 and g of x be 0.7x. Describe what the functions f and g model in terms of the price of the computer. The function f, okay, says you're not going to pay full price. You're going to get $260 off. So it means that's going to give you your price after a 260% discount. All right, g what G says is you're going to pay, if I make this a, a percent, move it over twice, this means you're going to pay 70% of the price, which means you're going to save, you're going to have a 30% discount. Does that make sense? This says that's what you'll pay, but that means that's what you're going to save. All right, so now if I find F of G of X, so if I do F of G of X, I find g of x first, which says 0.7x, plug it in there. So they want me to find, oops, they want me to find f of 0.7x, which says take x, oops, take whatever you brought and subtract 260. And what I'm bringing is 0.7x. So there's my function of f of g of x is 0.7x minus 260. And what that means is, first, because you're doing g of x first, that means you're taking, you're first doing a 30% discount, and then you're taking the 260 off. If you do g of f of x, g of f of x means I've got to find f of x first, which is x minus 260. And then I take that, and they want me to find g of that, which says 0 0.7 times whatever you brought, which is x minus 260. Okay, so that's where they got this. And what that means is, since we're doing f first, we're taking the $260 discount first, and then the 30% discount. All right, so let's, it's, it says, which composite functions models the greater discount on the computer, f of g or g of f and y? All right, well, to figure this out, um, I need more room. Oh, no, I, I can erase it. There's my two functions, okay? So I'm going to erase all this ink, sorry. There's my two functions. Let's make up a price. Let's say that the computer is $100. Yeah, good luck with that. But let's just pretend, okay? If I do f of g of 100 first, Okay, then I would be using this function, which says 0 0.7 times 100 minus 260. So if I type that in, 0 0.7 times 100 minus 260. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Oh, I can't have it. Let's say the computer's $1,000, shall we? Uh, if it's $100, I can't save 260 because it's not even that much. i got to pick a price bigger than my savings. All right, so if I do 0 0.7 times 1,000, I get 700 minus 260 gives me 440. If I do the if I do the 30% um, discount first and then do the 260, I'm going to pay 440. What if I do g of f of 1,000? Well, then I would do the f function first, which would say to get f of a thousand, or I could use this function right there, so I would have 0 0.7 times a thousand minus 260, because I'd first take the 260 off, which gives me 740, and then only pay 70% of that, so times 0 0.7, I get $518. So which one is the better deal, f of g of x or g of f of x? Well, this one's you're going to pay a lot less, so f of g models it is going to be the greater discount. All right.
Um, this one says find f of g of x and g of f of x and decide if they are inverses or not. If you get the mother function both times, then they are. If you don't, then they're not. So to do f of g of x, I start with finding g of x, which is x plus 7 over 9. Then I'm going to plug that in to right here. So they want me to find f of x plus 7 over 9, which the f function says 9 times whatever you brought minus 7. I brought x plus 7 over 9. Simplify that. The 9's would cancel. I get x plus 7 minus 7. The 7's cancel, and I get another function. To find g of f of x, I find f of x first, which is 9x minus 7. And I take that to the g function. So I'm finding g of 9x minus 7. I'm replacing f of x with that. And g says, whatever you brought, add 7 and divide by 9. And I brought 9x minus 7. The 7s cancel, which leaves me with 9x divided by 9, which gives me x, the mother function. And since I got the mother on both compositions, the pair are inverses. Okay, same thing here. So if I find f of g of x, I have to find g of x first. And g of x is 5 over x plus 4. So they want me to find f of 5 over x plus 4. The f function says to take 5 over whatever you brought and subtract 4 from it. I brought 5 over x plus 4. Simplify that. The 4's cancel. And that leaves me with 5 over 5 over x. Keep, change, flip. The 5's cancel. And I get x. To find g of f of x, I have to find f of x first. And f of x equals 5 over x minus 4. So they want me to find g of 5 over x minus 4. And g says 5 over whatever you brought plus 4. And I brought 5 over x minus 4. I'm going to keep change flip this fraction. So keep the 5, change to times, flip the fraction. The 5's cancel. That leaves me with x minus 4 plus 4. Those cancel, and I get mother function, which means they are inverses to each other. Okay, this one says the function is 1 to 1. Write an equation for the inverse of the function. To do that, you rewrite the function with y. Then you're going to switch x and y. So I'm going to have x equals 6y plus 3 over uh, y, minus, yeah, y minus 8. And now I've got to get y alone. Well, this one's kind of a mess because I've got two y's, but I've got to kill the fraction. So I'm going to multiply by y minus 8. That's going to give me x times y minus 8 equals 6y plus 3. I need to get my y's together, so before I can do that, I'm going to have to distribute, which gives me xy minus 8x equals 6y plus 3. Now I need to get my y's on the same side, so I'm going to minus 6y minus 6y. That gives me xy minus 6y minus 8x equals 3. I'm going to get rid of that x term, so I'm going to add 8x. I get xy minus 6y equals 8x plus 3. I'm going to factor out my y. GCF gives me x minus 6 equals 8x plus 3. To get y alone, I'm going to divide by x minus 6. And my inverse function of x is 8x plus 3 over x minus 6. Okay. Does the graph represent a function that has an inverse? If it passes the vertical and the horizontal line test, it passes vertical, it does not pass horizontal because this horizontal line that I draw, draw hits a whole bunch of points. So no, this does not have an inverse. I mean, it has an inverse, but it's not a function. Oops.
All right, so this one says use the graph to draw the inverse. Well, all you got to do is get a, well, if it's multiple choice, guys, look, draw mother and then reflect. So this one would come like this. You're looking for the graph that does that, which is this one. You should be accurate, though. You could enlarge that and get ordered pairs. This would be negative or negative 5, 1, 2, 3, 4. That's negative 5, negative 5, 1, 2, 3, negative 3, 2, 1, 2, 2, 3. So if I wanted to graph it, the inverse, switch the ordered pairs, And I end up with negative 5, negative 5, 2, negative 3, 3, 2, and there's the inverse. All right, for the function f of x equals 5x minus 6, determine whether the function is 1 to 1. If so, find a formula for the inverse, give the domain and the range, and then graph both functions in the same coordinate plane. Is the function 1 to 1? Well, if you graph this, guys, it's going to be a line. 5x minus 6, so start at negative 6 and go up 5 over 1. It's a line. It passes the vertical, it passes the horizontal, so yes, it's 1 to 1. So to find the inverse, you switch to y equal 5x minus 6. Then you switch x and y, so x equals 5y minus 6. Then you get y alone. x plus 6 equals 5y, divide by 5, and you get the inverse function of x is x plus 6 over 5. And then it says choose the correct domain. There's no drama. I mean, yeah, we have a fraction, but there's no letter in it. There's no even radical. So your domain is negative infinity to infinity. This is still going to be a line, so its range is negative infinity to infinity. And if you graph them both, again, if you look at this, find where mother... Uh, well, this one, they kind of tricked me. This one I know is out. Oh, but it's between these three. Those You're going to have to enlarge those. And then look at the graph. Okay. I'm trying to think if you want to use your graph and calculator. Probably not. I shouldn't let you do that because you're not going to have them on the EOC. If you were graphing this, to graph the original function, f, you would start at negative 6. And you go up 5 and over 1. There's f. Graph f inverse. This would be one fifth x, or x over five, which is one fifth x plus six fifths. So you'd start at a little more than one, and you'd go up one and over five. One, two, three, four, five. So it's got to be this one, and that's the graph. Yeah. All right, so same directions here. All right, this would be a parabola, which would not pass a horizontal line test. But see how they restricted it, and they said x has to stay less than or equal to 12? That means that they're only going to graph half of it, because this would be a parabola 12 inches over, yes? Right, so if they only graph this half of it, I guess. I don't know what the graph is. What half they're graphing? Anyway, as long as they restrict it, then then I can find its inverse. So to find its inverse, we have y equals x minus 12 squared. Um, to get, I got to switch x and y. So I have x equals y minus 12 squared. Solve for y, I get the square root of x equals y minus 12, add 12, and I get the inverse function of x is the square root of x plus 12. Why are they getting a negative? Switch x and y. Square root, square root. I'm confused. Where did they get a negative from?
Because I'd add 12 and add 12, that's not negative though. So y equals, unless you had to do the plus or minus thing. But even so, then where isn't the other one? Huh. I got the square root of x plus 12. sure why they got a negative square root x. Hmm. Yeah, because here's my function. Remember they said from less than 12. So here's that part of the function. And then if I graph the inverse, but I have a positive one. y equals which x and y get y alone when I square root this it's I mean technically it would be plus or minus right why won't the positive one work Hmm. I'm going to have to check that one out, guys, a little bit later. I'm not sure why they got a negative square root of x. But the restriction on the inverse is going to say x has to stay greater than or equal to 0 because this radical has to stay positive. So then when you graph those two, you get that function, and you can see mother's in the middle. The graph is easy because none of the rest of them even... No, this one doesn't even work. This is the only one that has a proper function. All right, so the domain of the inverse would be from negative infinity to positive 12. And the range would be 0 to infinity because it won't go below 0. Again, this doesn't make any sense. If you're looking at the inverse, that's the red one. It's not going from negative infinity to 12. It's going from 0 to infinity. I'm going to have to email the company on this one. This one, I don't agree with this answer, and I don't agree with this answer. All right, so 40, it says, given the function f of x equals x plus 6 cubed, they want me to find the inverse, so I have y equals x plus 6 cubed. Switch x and y, so I have x equals y plus 6 cubed. Get y alone, so I'm going to take the cube root of both sides. So that gives me the cube root of x equals y plus 6. So to get y alone, minus 6. And the inverse function of x is the cube root of x minus 6. If I graph this, if I graph this function, again, if you look at them, can't be that one. Mother doesn't. The rest of them, I guess it could be because mother does intersect where they intersect. So you're going to have to graph this thing. All right, to graph x plus 6 cubed, you have a couple of choices. You can use your transformations. I know that this thing is going to be 6 units to the left. In this. Oh yeah, 6 units to the left. And it's going to be that cubic function that goes right here. Yes, or you could generate a couple of points. Okay, so if I did f of, I don't know, let's do negative 7. I'd have negative 7 plus 6 cubed. That'd be negative 1 cubed, which would be negative 1. So negative 7, negative 1. If I do negative 6, I'd have 0 cubed, which is your 6, 0. And then, um, I don't know, do f of negative 5. Let's do negative 4. 
I'd have negative 4 plus 6 cubed would be 2 cubed, which would be 8. So at negative 4, 8 is up there. And then if you switch those ordered pairs and graph them, you'll get this function. All right, your domain for cubics always or cube roots is negative infinity to infinity. All right, so... Can I just do this one? No. All right, so we got another one. We want to find the inverse, so switch to y. Switch x and y. Solve for y. So I get x minus 9 equals the cube root of y. Cube the cube root. And I get the inverse function of x equals x minus 9 cubed. And then we choose the correct graph. Again, we have, well, that one's out. And the other ones could be true. So if I do this one, generate some points. Let's pick f of, I don't know, negative 8. Because I'd have the cube root of negative 8 plus 9. That would be negative 2 plus 9, which would be 7. So if I graph negative 8, 7. Let's pick f of, I don't know, 0. We have the cube root of 0 plus 9. That would be 0 plus 9. So I got 0, 9. And then, um, I don't know, pick f of 8. Which would be the cube root of 8 plus 9, which would be 2 plus 9, which would be 11. So I got 8, 11. So if I plot those points, if I plot those points, negative 8, 7, right there, 0, 9, and 8, 11, and I know that this thing has to do this curvy thing, right? which I can't draw. I don't draw very well at all. All right, then you flip those ordered pairs. So 7, negative 8, 9, 0, 11, 8. 7, negative 8, 9, 0, 11, 8 will be up here. So then you do this, <laughs> forgive my drawing, and you get this. All right. Again, cubics, your domain is all real numbers, so is your range. Oh, good grief. All right, a study of 900 working women showed that their feelings changed throughout the day. As the graph indicates, the women felt better as time passed, except for a blip, that is a slang for relative maximum, at lunchtime. Answer the following. Does the graph have an inverse that is a function? No, because it doesn't pass the horizontal line test. Okay, it says identify the times when the average happiness level is 3.5. So I'm looking for any points that hit 3.5, which is at 12 and at 19. Okay, so at, no, it's not at 12, it's at 1,300 hours and at 19. Okay, and it says express the above answers as ordered pairs. So you would have 13 comma 3.5 and you would have 19 comma 3.5. Do the ordered pairs in part B indicate that the graph represents a one to one function? No, because y values are the same. And to pass a horizontal line test, you can never have equal y values, which is why it doesn't pass the horizontal line test. There, 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 there. doesn't pass. All right, so other than that one stupid problem, which I will try and get an answer for you to, that is your review. So happy working, and I will see you next time.